Son Chris wants to come see you. We got to work this out. I like that. See you later. Johnny Powell, you know. Carter. President, how are you, Chris? Had Well, uh, I understand you go right at it, so I can tell you I've had breakfast because I figured I couldn't eat and talk at the same time. Well, we can get started. I think that uh, David wanted to say a little something first, but uh, well, whatever you, it's your party, so whatever you do. Let's hope he's eating breakfast also. Let's hope he's eating breakfast also if he's going to talk. Ladies and gentlemen, if we may proceed, I have the privilege of welcoming all of you to the White House on behalf of the President. It was in February of 1966, I guess many of you know, that Bud Sperling first invited a guest to breakfast with a Washington journalist. And since that time, some 1,500 uh, guests have had the privilege and honor of, of uh, dining uh, with you in the mornings. Uh, is, to the best of my knowledge, Bud, only one has uh, slept through the event. Uh, one didn't come because he was in a daze, and as so far as I know, uh, no guest has ever had breakfast. But in any event, uh, every one of these occasions has, uh, has been generated a lot of discussion. They've often been very productive. And it was to honor the 17th anniversary of the Sperling breakfast uh, that President Reagan invited all of you here today. Now, a couple of words about ground rules. <clears throat> We've talked with Budge, and it's been agreed that the transcript of this occasion will be made available to all of you through Karna Small's office, and you can pick up transcripts in room 45 of the old executive office building after 1 o'clock today. You may want to check with Karna's office just before you come to make sure they're there. The embargo in line with our conversation with Budge will be in effect so that the first time anything from this uh, session uh, is to be open for print is in the first editions, the Bulldog editions of the morning papers. Not for PM today, but for AM papers tomorrow morning. We will make the transcripts available only to those of you here in the room during the day today. Tomorrow morning, Larry will provide transcripts to the rest of the press corps. We would ask today that uh, because of the size of the room, the number of people here, you mean there's more? Uh, that yeah. when, you have a when you have a chance to ask a question, that you do please use the microphone and identify yourself. And with that, I think following tradition, Budge, you've got the first question, and we'll, let, we'll turn things over to you from there. Well, if it's, uh, if it's all right, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. President, uh, our custom is to just remain seated, uh, just as we are here, and take questions. Uh, before I do ask the first question, uh, I was going to welcome you to our breakfast, but Karna called 
caught me on that and said, uh, remember, uh, the president is the host, and I will remember that. But we are <laughs> delighted to be here, and uh, I want to thank you and, uh, for your hospitality. Uh, I, I think this breakfast will be memorable, partly because it will be so good, and also in contrast to the kind of breakfast we get every day with the Sheridan Carlton. Having said that, uh, the first question, I'm taking this question really away from Bob Novak. He said, uh, I bet you're going to take my question, the, the running question. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm first. I'm going to take it away from you, Bob. And there you are. But we had the, national, the Republican national chairman at breakfast the other uh, morning, uh, a couple of weeks ago, in fact. And among other things, he said that he very much wanted a, a signal from you, Mr. President, as to whether you'd be running or not. And in fact, he said he needed it very badly. Uh, and. Uh, I just wondered, perhaps, could you help the poor fellow out this morning? <coughs> a signal on whether you're going to run or not. Well, I think the one thing that we just have to have to face, and I think that he should have to, that he should be willing to live with for a while, why there's a 50 percent chance. A 50 percent chance. <laughs> yeah. You can't make it a, a 51. <laughs> something like that. I'm not that good at mathematics. Incidentally, may I say, with regard to uh, the opening remark about that, no one eats breakfast. Um, I ate breakfast first because they told me I'd be answering questions right away. Rules are you can talk with your mouth full, but go ahead and eat breakfast. It's on the house. <laughs> well, I, I was going to push that a little harder. Can, can't we get any more, any more on this on this running bit? Uh, this is. A... I think. No, I've said repeatedly. I I think there is a timing to this, and I think that the people sort of uh, indicate uh, and help in making up the decision. I think to do it too early leaves you open to the charge that everything you try to do is uh, uh, based on politics, and uh, uh, and if you um, and if you say the other way uh, too soon, why uh, you were a lame duck uh, prematurely. So I think it's a decision that uh, I will come to, and I will make. I, what I think is appropriate time. Well, through the years, for a number of years, Pete Lissagor was right at my right hand, the great reporter, Pete Lissagor, and uh, perhaps the best questioner in the, in the city. And uh, about this time, he would come in with his question. He asked, he'd say, well, uh, I'm sure he'd say, Mr. President, uh, the guard to, to running again, are you, are you salivating a little bit? <laughs> how, how, how do you come up to the uh, Pete Lissagor salivating test? Well, um, between sweating and sal salivating, <laughs> uh, it's, um, some days are just better and some days are worse than others. Uh, no, with regard to running for the presidency. Well. Is it looking better to you all the time? Uh, well, the economy's looking better. I'm, you're, uh, I'm, I'm being crowded on this, but uh, I, I just, I can't have an answer at this all time. All right. <coughs> All right, let's Rick and then over to Jack. President Rick Smith, New York Times. You said yesterday in your speech that your government was prepared to do everything that was necessary to help secure Israel's northern frontier. What does that mean, Mr. President? Does that involve uh, putting American Marines or troops down in southern Lebanon to police that area? Does it involve some kind of international arrangement? Did you have specific ideas in mind? Well, yes, this isn't anything different than has been said before by me and by several presidents before me, that this country has always uh, maintained that it has an obligation to the security of, of Israel. But in this particular instance, I was asked to answering the question, and I thought I made it plain that I was talking about with the withdrawal, that in the aftermath of that withdrawal, uh, we were prepared to guarantee their safety on the northern border. Let me recall to you that that was the reason for the invasion in the first place, that there was shelling and rocketing across that border, um, taking its toll of casualties uh, in Israel. And our idea of trying to settle the Lebanon thing before we get into the actual peace negotiations, I think is a sound one, after all the years of disruption there, to give the government of Lebanon a chance to uh, stabilize its country and assume its control and sovereignty over its own territory. Now, in that instance, uh, I have already said that we, in consultation with our allies and the multinational force, would be prepared until Lebanon was actually uh, stabilized and able uh, to guarantee this safety, that we would be willing to enlarge the multinational forces. This is, of course, uh, 
in consultation with our allies, as I said before, and thus ensure the safety of those borders until uh, this process is completed, until Lebanon is ready to take over the uh, protection of its own borders. And so there isn't anything new in that, and I was a little surprised at, at the, uh, the uh, wind that started blowing after I said it. How much enlargement of forces do you have in mind, sir? What? How much enlargement of the multinational force do you have in mind? Actually, have not, we have not dealt in, in figures yet. That would, I think, uh, have to follow a military review of what the responsibilities would be. Jack, you are, I saw you next. Jack Kilpatrick, Universal Press. Mr. President, about 250 members of the House have sponsored bills to repeal the, uh, the uh, withholding of the tax on interest and dividends, and more than 50 members of the Senate also are undertaking to repeal that withholding provision. If that bill should pass, would you veto it? Well, Jack, I've always kind of held to a rule that until it's uh, I'll talk about vetoes in general principle, but until it actually gets to my desk, I've always said in the legislative process, sometimes an orange becomes an apple and I'll wait and make that decision. But I do think that they're entirely wrong, and I think that a, a great lobbying effort has resulted in much distortion. First of all, if anyone looks at the withholding uh, that we imposed, it is, it first of all protects uh, all those people that they seem to be worrying about at the lower, uh, lower level of earnings, it protects all the senior citizens, everyone over 65. Uh, they would not be affected by this. And it's not aimed in any way at increasing tax, as has been uh, mistakenly uh, reported, on the, on the people that are receiving these uh, uh, interest and dividend revenues. It is aimed at catching the people that are using this device to avoid paying an income tax they legitimately owe. And we have found that that is one of the big uh, parts of our non-collection of taxes that are owed. And this, we figured, was only fair to the people that are going out there and paying their taxes to see if we couldn't get a handle on those that are avoiding it. Bob, you're next, and then Andy. Mr. President, Bob Pittsburgh, the New House newspaper. Uh, in view of the increasing criticism of the EPA, some of it now coming from Republicans, uh, do you have any plans, uh, specific plans, for uh, improving the performance and the credibility of the EPA? Well, if it will improve the credibility, one thing, yes, we're any of the allegations, any of the accusations, and I must say that I haven't found much substantiation accompanying uh, those, but any of those are immediately turned over to the Justice Department and the FBI is investigating and tracking down every, every charge that's been made. Uh, we have worked out this arrangement now while protecting executive privilege, but at the same time, because of uh, some of these charges, we want the people to have confidence that um, they will have access. The other thing that I've been struck by in all of this, that so little attention has been paid to the fact that from the very beginning, the director of EPA was willing to make available to the Congress almost 800,000 documents, and fewer than 100, the tiniest fraction of a percent, were withheld because uh, not only advice of the Justice Department also that these were investigative reports and that these were things that could compromise uh, litigation that might take place. Now, this arrangement, as I say, has been made, but I don't feel that uh, I have the right in custody temporarily of this uh, institution, the presidency, to set a precedent that takes away from that institution uh, some of its legitimate rights and functions, and Andy. one of those is executive privilege. Uh, Andy, and then Bart, and I'm going down the table, then I'm going to go over here to the right. President, I'm Andy Glass from the Cox newspaper. Taking a convenient reference point, like Budge's 15th anniversary breakfast, which would have been very early in your presidency, and looking back to that time when you had just come here, can you assess in your own mind and your own feelings how do you think you've done in these two years since 
what your disappointments are, what your perhaps uh, accomplishments as you see them, a, a self-report card, if you will. Well, a disappointment would be that we didn't get all the things we asked for in our economic proposals. I think we'd be better off today if we had, but uh, I'm pleased that we got as much as we did. I've had eight years' experience, almost eight years, since as a governor with a legislature of the opposite party, so I knew exactly what I was up against. But I think the very fact that the debate has changed from people of my persuasion in the Republican Party fighting rearguard actions, trying to slow down the growth of government and halt the imposition of uh, new social engineering programs. The debate today isn't whether to reduce spending, it's how much to reduce it. And I think we've changed the whole, whole tone of the debate that has been taking place over the last few decades. And I'm very pleased about that. But we have made progress. We have sizably reduced the uh, percentage of increase uh, in government spending. You, you don't come in, and I don't think there's any way that you come in and actually reverse spending and, and come in with a budget of less money than was spent the year before, and certainly not in a time of inflation. But we have brought inflation uh, down. The last few months it was running at only a 1.1 annualized rate. 3.9% for the year, down from double digits. That in turn brought down the interest rates. The economy has started to turn, and I've just noticed that Time Magazine's whole battery of economists has substantiated that and are referring to the recession as being over. Um, I think that the, in that, in the foreign policy, we were quite amazed at how much in disarray uh, we were uh, back at the beginning of this administration, what we found with regard to the feeling of our allies, uh, our relationship with uh, Latin America neighbors, and our defense posture. And I think there's been a drastic turnaround in that. I don't think relations have ever been better between us and our European allies and Japan. Uh, we've made progress in our relations over in, in Asia, and there's no question about the improvement of our defense posture. I'd like to just tell you the sequence as I saw the hands. Don't throw any. I got Bart coming up next, and then Ted, and then Pat, and then Joe, and I'm going over to Bob. And then I'll come and, and, and Bob, the two Bobs, then I'll come back. Mr. President, I'm Bart Rowan of the Washington Post. I'd like to ask you, sir, a question about the summits. Uh, Secretary Schultz said the other day that there is no, be no federal agenda for the meeting in Williamsburg. The basic idea is for you and other heads of states to have a chance to have a private meeting private exchange of ideas together. I'd like to ask you first what you expect to accomplish specifically at Williamsburg, and secondly, in light of your experiences at uh, Ottawa, Cancun, and at Versailles, uh, whether you think that summitry is, is still a useful tool in the formulation of goals and, and uh, strategies for governance. Yes, I do. I have always believed that uh, you only get in trouble when you're talking about each other, not when you're talking to each other. The, uh, and the reason for this, this change is because uh, some of the summitries became so formalized, and by time people organizing at the ministerial level had finished their chores, uh, you found that uh, you were actually arguing about the communique that would be released, uh, summing up what had done at the summit, and you were talking and arguing about that before the summit had started and it became very formalized. Now, we're all in that summit on a first-name basis, and some of us informally talking in the previous summits have talked about why not have a meeting and get around the table and just throw the subjects out on the table. What, what are the things that are of concern to us? Uh, what are the things we think we can do together and so forth? And so being the host this time and therefore having a voice in that, uh, I communicated uh, with my colleagues in the other countries on that basis, and they were all delighted that we'll come here and, uh, yes, there are, there are always points of difference and things that have to be ironed out, but there are also things that, uh, which we're in great agreement on. So we're not going to have that kind of a formal agenda. We're going to treat with all the problems that are of concern to all of us, whether they have to do with trade, whether they have to do with our uh, mutual defense posture, all of those things. All right, Ted. President uh, Ted Knapp of Scrooge. The Social Security Administration has 
Security Is this okay? Can you hear? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Social Security Commission recommended that the full retirement age uh, be increased to 66 after the year uh, 2000 and that legislation be enacted uh, promptly so that people could plan on that. Uh, I haven't heard you uh, express your, your view on that uh, recommendation. Do you endorse it? Well, Ted, I have to tell you that from our first attempts to do something about the fiscal integrity of Social Security uh, more than a year ago, and the way in which that was immediately and instantly transformed into a political football, I decided this time to make a fair catch and then just fall on the ball. Um, we're, we have approved the Bipartisan Commission report for the immediate fiscal problem. We do know that there is now the long-range problem that has not been completely solved. And uh, rather than make a specific answer there, let me say that uh, we know and are going to be ready to go into, uh, again, a study and hopefully as bipartisan as this first agreement as to how we meet that long-range uh, actuarial imbalance. Now, I'm convinced that things like that, uh, extending the age, will be uh, under consideration. No decisions, of course, have been made, and I think it would be wrong for me in advance of any such negotiations to start uh, talking about them. But I think it is, there's a great deal of logic in something of that kind when you stop to think that when Social Security started, and quoting the man who created it, who was in his 90s now and who recently was, had a full page uh, statement in the, uh, uh, in the Washington Post, that um, he was revealing the mistakes that they had made in the beginning. And one of them was that longevity was uh, so much less than it is now that they didn't think very many people would get to the age 65 to claim <laughs> their Social Security payments. Well, we know how much we've improved in longevity, and I think that it's only right that we should look at that. Is 65 now a proper age when we legally have, have uh, turned to the age 70 as uh, now a, a legitimate age for retirement? Uh, Pat, and then Joe, and then the two Bobs, and then back to Jack Nelson. I'm going to do the best I can here. I'm... Use the mic. Pick it up, please. We can't hear up here. Pat Ferguson of the Baltimore Sun. To return to the EPA, which is such a hot subject now, there are some suggestions and some bills being formulated on the Hill to remove the EPA from partisan politics by putting it under supervision of an independent commission similar to other regulatory commissions. What is your reaction to that idea? My reaction is that it's the wrong way to go. I think that the more government is in the hands of elected representatives of the people, and the less it is in the hands of appointed and um, bureaucratic uh, permanent structure of government who are not beholden to the voters and not held responsible or can't be held responsible by them, uh, I think that we improve. I believe that some of the things that are being suggested are part of the same age-old battle between the branches of government in which the legislative seeks again to reduce some of the rights and powers of the presidency. Now, in the overall question of the EPA and what is at issue, it seems to me that once again we're falling in, as I said the other night in the press conference, to that trap of uh, running as if the sky is falling just on the basis of accusations without waiting to see if there is merit in the accusation or if there is any substance back of it. The EPA has, in truth, done a fine job. We came in and found a backlog, for example, in uh, air pollution violations of hundreds of cases. That backlog has been totally eliminated now, and a solution found for those problems. The, I mentioned earlier, the uh, a number of documents that we were willing to make available. The fact that we have turned anything that has to do with a, a charge or accusation over to the Justice Department, the FBI, for investigation, and my own statement that I would never employ executive privilege uh, to try and cover up any wrongdoing. So I think that they're getting way ahead of themselves in uh, what they're suggesting with that kind of a a kind of a measure. Joe? Mr. President, uh, Joe Kraft, Los Angeles Times Syndicate. 
uh, in your speech to the American Legion, you set forward four principles that would govern this country's approach to the intermediate range uh, nuclear force negotiations in Geneva. Do those principles in any way conflict with the proposals or ideas advanced by uh, Ambassador Nitsa, and if so, how? No, because from the very beginning, in before the press club, when I made the first proposal about our INF uh, policy and our desire, our goal to try and get uh, zero option, total elimination of that class of weapons and uh, wipe them out of the world, I also said then, and have reiterated it many times, that we, on the other hand, were going there to negotiate and would negotiate in good faith on any reasonable proposal, any legitimate proposal uh, that might be presented. And uh, we're still willing to do that. We still believe that the morality of the position we first took, that that goal should be the ultimate goal for all of us, to get rid of the most destabilizing weapons in the world, uh, interballistic missiles, uh, uh, or, or ballistic missiles, I should say, of an intermediate range in which in a matter of just five to seven seconds are zeroed in on virtually every uh, target in Europe, but only from one side. Now, so far, the Soviet Union has seemed to want to continue its monopoly, that uh, they have shown evidences of being willing to reduce, to a certain extent, their weapons. But that, in return for that, we would have to remain at zero. Well, I just think this is a threat that we can't tolerate. My follow-up, does that mean, sir, that the NHTSA proposals, as far as you want as far as this government is concerned, are still in play, A, and B, in view of the distinction you've just made between uh, short warning and more lengthy ones, do you make a distinction between the Pershings that are uh, in our original proposal and the crews which take longer to arrive? Well, there's a very great difference between the two weapons. One of them takes several hours to get where the other one gets in several seconds. But I, I'm not sure, Joe, that I understand uh, just what proposal you're, you're referring to from, from Nitsa? Uh, Paul Nitsa, I believe, went for a walk with the Soviet delegate uh, and add a fairly, it's now been aired pretty widely, a proposal that I think is not in con conflict with the four principles you enunciated. And my question really goes to the issue of whether, from your point of view, the Nitsa proposals are still alive. Uh, the only thing that I, no, he, he referred to, to us uh, a hint that had been dropped by the man he walked in the woods with, but nothing that he had said back. And um, that, that proposal from the other side was an indication that they might look more kindly on cruise missiles than on the Pershings. Well, again, I don't think cruise missiles alone would be a deterrent uh, to the uh, SS-20s. Uh, the two Bobs next, and then Jack Nelson, and then <coughs> Ringo was next, and I'm, I've seen a lot of hands, and I'll be just as fair as I can be. Mr. President, Bob Thompson of the Hearst Newspapers. About three weeks ago, your two most recent predecessors, Mr. Carter and Mr. Ford, got together out of Grand Rapids. And uh, they took issue with your proclivity for condemning everything that happened before you got to the White House and blaming them. I have two parts to this. First of all, do you think you blame them too much? Are you ready to stop that? And number two, are you ready to take responsibility after two, more than two years for what now goes on in this nation, economically and, and socially and whatnot? Well, I'll take responsibility for the fact that the interest rates have come down, inflation has come down, the economy <laughs> is turning around, uh, the housing starts are up to a figure that they haven't been since 1979. I'll take very happy to take responsibility for that. I have pointed out uh, at times that those people that say that my economic proposals were responsible for everything that happened from January 20th on, well, you come into office in well into the fiscal year with a budget you inherited from the previous administration. Uh, there isn't anything other than we did manage with some management improvements to whittle down by a few billion dollars the budget we'd inherited, the spending proposed. But um, the 
economy falling off the cliff, which I think was a continuation of a recession that started in 1979, took place in July, well, even the first phase of our economic proposals did not go into effect until October 1st. We hadn't even, I hadn't even signed the uh, legislation yet when the economy fell in that hole. Incidentally, let me correct one thing. Uh, <coughs> I find that while it was indicated that and there was agreement on some things uh, between the two gentlemen, Mr. Ford was not a party to the statement about my blaming uh, the previous administrations. Uh, in fact, he himself is quite outspoken in the fact that um, uh, when he was seeking re-election in 76, that uh, the Carter administration invented the misery index, which came about from adding unemployment to the rate of inflation. And his statement was that no man with an, a misery index of 12.5 percent had a right to run for the presidency. But when uh, I ran for the presidency and uh, Mr. Carter's misery index was up to 19.5, and, and uh, we have now brought it down uh, somewhere in the vicinity of what it was back in 1976 before he took office. But uh, I'm trying to get along and to be bipartisan, but I think that it's only fair when you're accused of being responsible for 21.5% interest rates, and they were that high before you got here, that you point that out. Was Mr. Ford talk to you personally about the situation? Uh, we, we frequently are in touch and have conversations, yes. Bob? <clears throat> Robert Novak, Field Syndicate. Uh, Mr. President, after two years in office, do you think now, based on your experience in office, that it is first desirable and second feasible to restore the gold standard while you are president? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had an answer on that. I must say there are, uh, that is in economic circles I know is one of the great debates that will go on and on. You can point back to history and show that Fiat money has never been successful, and in reality, that's what we have is fiat money. Now, uh, we've had a study uh, that's been going forward on that, and there, there are many variations of, uh, of what could be done uh, in partially, let's say, getting uh, uh, metallic money back in, in, uh, in circulation. Uh, I can't give you an answer on that because uh, as I say, it's something that uh, uh, we're all of us looking at and wondering about. There does seem to be more sentiment against it in this modern day than uh, there is for it. Can I ask you if you, would, if you think it would be a good idea, well short of that, to summon an international monetary conference in the, in the near future to discuss the uh, <coughs> swings in exchange fluctuations and the other difficulties in the uh, financial, international financial structure. Well, Bobby, in that informal structure of, at Williamsburg, uh, who knows, that may come up. You would, you would not favor a, a, uh, a special international monetary conference well, I mean, beyond that? The subject of that, of whether to do such oh. a thing might come up. Oh, All right, Jack Nelson, and then Bill Ringle, and then Al Cromley, and I see a lot of hands. I'm going to be just as fair as I can be. of Soviet missiles in Syria might provoke Israel into making what they would consider a preemptive strike. And now Moshe Ahrens, the new defense minister of Israel, uh, has said that he considers it to be a very unpleasant situation and that if uh, uh, Israel does determine that there's a mortal threat, uh, they would not rule out making a preemptive strike as they have in the past. I wonder if you share that concern and if the United States is uh, looking at anything that might help uh, address the question of whether there is a military imbalance called, caused by this missile buildup? Well, I don't think that uh, anyone can make a claim of a military imbalance. Uh, the, I think the Israelis have proven very much their own military capability in that area. But yes, it is an alarming situation, uh, all of what's going on, and I think that what we have proposed and what we're trying to accomplish is the answer to it get all the foreign forces out of Lebanon and then immediately proceed with peace negotiations. And we have been working uh, with the Arab nations, we've been working with the Israelis, 
we believe that the time is now, that there is a feeling on the part of everyone there that uh, peace is the answer to the problems in the Middle East. Mr. Aaron suggests, Mr. President, that there should be no timetable on withdrawal of troops. Do you agree with that? No, I don't agree. I think time, time, is, not on our, time is not on our side in this. And uh, uh, I believe there's no reason why, with the proposals that we've made, that the PLO remnants that are still in, in Lebanon, the Syrians and the Israelis, uh, why they can't get out of that country, of, of Lebanon, and let the Lebanese government try to reestablish itself and establish sovereignty over its own land. Time. Do you think this should be done, in other words, before a peace treaty is reached between Israel and Lebanon? And do you think there should be a specific deadline that you might mention? I think to wait for a peace treaty uh, for the withdrawal of forces uh, is wrong. And I think that that can come about, and I think full normalization. I think there can be an agreement, an informal agreement there about uh, what they're going to do with regard to withdrawal and the terms of the border, and as I say, our own willingness then to uh, help in ensuring that there can't be incidents across that border uh, is enough, and then settle down to the business of full, formal normalization uh, with Lebanon. But the, the longer we delay in this, the more we endanger the possibility of moving on to the, into the general peace discussions. Bill, you, you're next, and then uh, Al, Jack Cole, you were next, and then Gary, and then Ken, and I'll probably forget this thing. Okay, I'm, I forgot you, Jim, here. Okay. Uh, William Ringo from the Gannett Newspapers. Uh, Mr. President, in your budget, you asked for uh, $5.8 billion for the International Monetary Fund, and this is been Pick up widely. Your mic. It's the only yeah. way they're going to well, listen. To I it. guess it's dead. Oh. No, 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 it's on. <laughs> Pick it up like this. Yeah. Oh. Very uh, directional. You asked for $5.8 billion for the International Monetary Fund, and this has been widely criticized as a bailout for the Western banks. And I wondered how, in a time of recession and, uh, and, uh, in, and uh, unemployment, you're going to sell this to the Congress and to the American public? Well, in reality, is not the actual putting up of uh, eight, eight and a fraction billion dollars, eight and a half billion dollars. It's a kind of a bookkeeping arrangement in which you have made this amount of a guarantee. But in the IMF, in return for that, you have drawing rights in that amount on the IMF. The IMF, it's not a bailout. The IMF is serving a very useful purpose in this time in which the whole world, uh, the international uh, banking situation, is uh, walking a tightrope. The IMF makes kind of short-term, brief loans to enable countries to get hold of their own financial situation again and not have to come into the, to come to the point of defaulting on their loans. And it's, it's served a very useful purpose. So I think if the people understood properly that this isn't eight and a half billion dollars cash that we're going to take out of our uh, funds and, or add to a deficit, uh, this is a uh, a kind of paper transaction, an, an underwriting, a guarantee. Al, and then Jack, and then over here, I got my editor here with the question. I haven't forgotten you, Ken, and there's a lot of others. Uh, Mr. President, Alan Trump, <coughs> Oklahoma. I'd like to ask how high on your agenda is decontrol of natural gas, and then at the risk of sounding like a shell of the oil and gas industry, particularly <laughs> in this group. <laughs> I'd like to ask why, in your quest for fairness in the State of the Union message, did you single out one industry, that is the energy industry, for uh, your, uh, to, to solve the budget deficit as a standby, uh, as a standby measure? Well, now I'm trying to recall what words are, uh, I said about that. Uh, I made a lot of speeches since that one. <laughs> um, I, I don't think I singled it out for any other purpose than that en energy is di directly related uh, to your industrial capacity, your industrial output. Uh, as to the agenda of natural gas and decontrol, we are in consultation with uh, leaders in the Hill and people in the committees that have to do with that, the energy committees. 
because uh, when you look at the record of what decontrol of oil did, when uh, I do recall that there was a great deal said about gasoline prices going to $2 a gallon if we decontrolled, and now uh, everyone seems to be distressed because they're below a dollar. But we've got a, the natural gas controls are so complex that there are probably 28, as many as 28 different pricing classifications. And they were supposed to protect the consumer, but we've had horrendous increases in the price of natural gas under this control. And uh, we are looking very seriously at, and as I say, meeting with the people on the Hill to see if decontrol with protection, real protection for the consumer is not the answer that we should be seeking right now. Jack. It had to be paid for wringing the inflation out of the economy. Now, I don't remember that you talked about that kind of pain when you ran for president in 1980. In fact, I think you talked about restoring the jobs that had already been lost at that time. And I wonder, sir, if you would concede that, uh, in fact, you were at least slightly overly optimistic in your 1980 campaign. No, in the 1980 proposals that I made during the campaign for the economic program that we later put in effect, that was based on all the economic projections that we could get from <coughs> the best people in that in that field. By the time of the election and before the inauguration, economic conditions had so worsened that what I had said in October was no longer appropriate. So we adjusted and in 81, in office, proposed the plan again. And then came the recession, which I don't think, uh, the, the added recession, I should say. I still refuse to say that we've had a separate recession, 79 and 80 and another one in 81. It's the same recession. I think that what happened was that pulling the string on, on uh, the money supply for the first several months of 1981, uh, maintaining the high interest rates, just continued what had already started, which was the almost closing down of the automobile market and housing. <laughs> either one of which can start a recession all by itself. And so we had this <coughs> increased unemployment. But remember, unemployment had been increasing for a long period of time. I myself referred to it when in the campaign, uh, in some of the towns in Michigan, uh, unemployment from Detroit to Flint and so forth was ranging anywhere from 18 to 20 percent. In a city in Indiana, depended on the automobile industry. It was more than 20 percent. And of course, steel and the associated industries from that and housing, from the sheer inability of people to buy a car on time or to get a mortgage for a house, all then the associated industries were beginning to grind down and, and lay people off. Mm -hmm. the, this no one that I know of <coughs> projected that severe slump that took place in July. And about 50 percent today of the anticipated deficits is due to that slump. We, we think, and there are a great many people outside, we're going to stick with our conservative proposals for recovery <coughs> and hope we'll be happily surprised. But almost every economic authority, every one who uh, reads the signs, believes that recovery is going to be better than we projected. But to suggest that you deliberately created unemployment to lower inflation just isn't true. And frankly, I'm not sure that anyone has really established a solid connection between unemployment uh, and inflation. All right, now Ed and then Gary, and then I'm going to Earl here, and then I'll give you another sequence right away. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Ed Preen of Copley News Service. I have a two-part question in connection with defense. <coughs> Senator Tower recently has written to his fellow senators asking them to uh, nominate uh, bases to be closed in their states or, and or contracts to be uh, aborted uh, for uh, defense work in their states. Uh, as far as I know, uh, only Dale Bumpers of Arkansas, who doesn't want a nerve gas plant uh, in his state, has responded. My question uh, has, have you had any volunteers from either the Senate or the House uh, in this connection? And uh, the second part of the question, also on defense, uh, can you tell us anything about the recent testing of Soviet ICBMs, uh, one of which may have been in violation of SALT II? Well, in the first place, uh, with regard to the uh, representatives and the senators and their uh, areas, no, I haven't had any volunteers. 
I think that John Tower thought that was probably a very good idea since some of the loudest squawkers against defense spending seemed to squawk just as loudly if you suggested that the reduction of some of that spending in their particular district might take place. And um, I thought it was a good idea that he proposed and make them look realistically at what they were proposing. Um, with regard to the uh, SALT II Treaty, uh, that, this was one of the objections, I think, that the Senate had that prevented them under the previous administration from ratifying that treaty, that it was so ambiguous and that it could best be described as a, a legitimizing of a continued arms buildup on both sides. But the, there have been hints, and yet so far, and up until this last case, and I don't have uh, a full answer on that one yet, it would have been very difficult. You could say, I'm convinced that these are violations, but it would have been very difficult to find the hard evidence to make it hold up in court. Um, this last one comes the closest to um, uh, indicating that it is a violation. But there's no question that uh, while there was a kind of an informal agreement that since the treaty had not been ratified but had, was still in existence there, uh, having been signed, that uh, both sides would uh, and agree uh, good faith that they would observe the things that they had arrived at in that treaty. Uh, this one, I think, makes it plain. The Soviet Union has really continued its, its buildup. As a matter of fact, in the INF thing that we talked about earlier, while they came to the table to talk to us about the reduction of intermediate range weapons, they continued right on schedule adding to their weapons all the time that these negotiations have been going on. They now have 342. All right, Gary, and then Earl, Mr. then President, Ken over here. Mr. President, Gary Schuster from the Detroit News. Are you of the same mind that uh, Fed Chairman Volcker is that uh, interest rates from here on out should be uh, reduced or, or, sh or should be uh, uh, controlled through the redefinition of money supply, uh, M1, M2, or, or do you feel that interest rates should be brought down another percent or two by the Fed at this kind of rate? Well, I know that they're very... <coughs> They're very concerned, the, the Fed, about the road they're, they're walking and how narrow it is. And what they, if they give a wrong signal uh, or a signal that might be taken wrong out in the financial markets, that they might um, in some way set back uh, this recovery, which they agree is, is taking place. I believe that with inflation at the level it is, that interest rates uh, uh, can come down more and should because it leaves the real interest rate uh, higher than, than is necessary uh, to cope with inflation. And um, I must say, on the other hand, though, that the, the Fed has been cooperating. We've been getting along very well after some uh, violations. Now, what he might have been referring to about M1 and M2 was this recent figure that looked like a big surge in the money supply, and it really wasn't but it was due to some of the changes in banking practices that had suddenly seen a flood of money go from money funds over into banking and suddenly loom as a great uh, increase in, in M2. And it, it really wasn't. And fortunately, the money markets, there was a tremor, and you thought maybe they were going to panic and think, oh, here we go again on another one of those uh, uh, roller coaster rides. But uh, they didn't, and they evidently read it correctly. You, you, you say that the interest rate should come down and, and, uh, and can come down more. Do you think they will? Well, this is up to the banks. Now, they're the ones uh, in the Fed. The, we have a, a low discount rate, and uh, there's no reason, I don't think, why the, why the banks could not uh, bring those interest rates down. All right, another uh, notch or two. Earl, you're next, and then Ken, and then Jim Dickinson's been waiting a long while, and I got to I got to see what's in my mind here. I'll tell you. Earl Fell, the Christian Science Monitor. Mr. President, um, if one follows the logic of your answer to Bart Rowan earlier about Williamsburg, uh, you ought to be looking at uh, a summit somewhere along the line with Mr. Andropov in terms of talking with him rather than about him. Uh, do you one? Do you? Uh, think it's conceivable you will be having a summit meeting with a Soviet leader 
uh, in your first term? And two, if so, what are the preconditions? Mr. Bush has mentioned one which seems to be unacceptable. Do you have any others in mind? Um, well, all this talk about whether I'm reluctant or not, uh, I tried to achieve a meeting with Brezhnev uh, uh, on the basis that he would be coming to New York on the, um, uh, the arms, the, the disarmament uh, session of the United Nations, and I'm, I guess we know now that he wasn't traveling anything of that kind because of his health. Other reasons were given as to why he couldn't come to New York. But, um, and I've, and Mr. Bush, uh, state to our allies in Europe, uh, my willingness to meet with Mr. Andropov on one subject, uh, any time, any place. I think that a, a summit meeting isn't something that uh, you just, like at Williamsburg, say, let's sit down at the table and talk. I think this is different. I think you have to have an agenda and some things to talk about because you do raise a lot of hopes and expectations in such a meeting. And uh, we're in communication. Uh, all the time with the Soviets. It isn't as if there's silence between the two of us. And uh, when and if the, the time is right and there's some uh, reason to meet, uh, I'm very willing to, uh, to meet with him. What, what factors would make you think uh, the time is right? Well, right now, I think the ball is a little bit in their court. I think that, I think that we need some deeds rather than words. Uh, to indicate that there is uh, something to negotiate, that we, uh, we can have a meeting and, and uh, discuss some of the differences between us. Uh, these could be on any one of a number of, of subjects. Uh, we made a move uh, in their direction when, when I withdrew the, the grain embargo, but there has been nothing in return that, that shows that uh, they're willing to, to um, make some changes in some of the things that are disturbing to us. Ken, and then Jim, and then Lars, and then Larry O'Rourke. They've all been waiting a long while. I've got a couple over here I know have been waiting, but they were not ahead of these others. Ken, Mr. President, I wanted to follow up on the question of interest rates. Uh, do you think that the Fed should force interest rates down, or they will fall uh, under current <laughs> Fed policy now? I think that the policy, the way it is right now, that the the banks uh, could do this. We've come down from that 21 and a half to a, an 11 point prime. The uh, discount rate is lower than that. But I, I think it is up to the, the banks, and I, I don't know what the Fed could do to, uh, to force that. They can't give orders. Just right. follow up. You seem satisfied then with Federal Reserve policy now. I wonder if you could tell us what sort of uh, political and economic considerations uh, you'll look at when you decide whether to reappoint Mr. Volcker as chairman or to put somebody else in that job? I know you can't tell us what you're going to do, but if no. you can tell us the, your framework for approaching that question, it would be helpful. I have to be honest with you and tell you that uh, I've had too much on my plate to even be uh, thinking about that at All the right. time. All right, Jim, and then Lars and Larry, we're getting near the end, Garnet tells me. I, I don't know what we can do. Well, I'd like to follow on the uh, arms control. Uh, you, you mentioned the four principles on uh, which you'd, uh, uh, you'd negotiate and everything. If you were a betting man, uh, Mr. President, uh, would you bet that there would be some sort of uh, compromise agreement uh, this year as a result of the talks of the Soviets? I think that there might be um, uh, some loosening of the Soviet attitude as we get closer to the day of deploying our intermediate range missiles in Europe. All right. Uh, did I say Lars next? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, last September you talked about uh, re perhaps restoring the West Bank to Jordanian sovereignty and, and some sort of federation. Uh, Prime Minister Begin rejected that immediately. Last night in your speech to the American Legion, you talked about the legitimate rights of the Palestinians, which is also a concept that Israel rejects. I just wonder, what are your plans for meeting with Israeli leaders and sorting out where it is you want to go in the Middle East? Well, we have, as you know, Ambassador Habib and others over there who are working with them in these negotiations, and uh, I'm prepared to do anything that will um, help bring them, uh, bring them along. I don't take too seriously the, uh, the statement of positions in advance of negotiations. Uh, 
everyone wants to preserve their position at the, uh, their highest price uh, before negotiations. And for them to do otherwise is to give away something they might not have to give away once the negotiations start. So uh, I think we have to wait until they get at the table. I think the recognition that I've stated that the Palestinian problem has to be a factor uh, in the solution. We cannot go on. That's been the, uh, the biggest problem now for a number of years. We can't go on with these people and not um, providing something in the nature of a homeland. On the other hand, uh, no one has ever uh, advocated creating a nation. And so I, th I'm, I just believe that, uh, as I say, that you, you wait until you get to the table. And uh, what, is, what is the stake for Israel? The stake is security. Uh, can they go on forever living as an armed camp? Their economy is suffering. They have 130 percent inflation rate. And they, they're having to maintain a, a military presence that is out of all proportion to their size as a nation. And so the, the greatest security for Israel, and this is what's back of our plan, is to create more Egypts, more nations, more neighbors that are willing to sign tr peace treaties with them. Now, the Israel, Israel proved its willingness to go and negotiate and, and to comply with uh, things that uh, weren't, certainly weren't appetizing to them and the giving up of the Sinai with Egypt. Well, what we're looking to is the same kind of relationship with most of their neighbors. Maybe not all the Arab states will be moderate. Maybe some of them will still continue to be holdouts. But I believe there's real evidence that the more moderate Arab states uh, do want a peace, and this would involve recognition of Israel's right to exist. We only have a couple more minutes. President, Quick one, Larry. Oh, well, I think that there is a danger or an intention while these talks are in the offing. That there is a danger or an Israeli intention simply to absorb the West Bank. Danger of it. You're not coming through this, the box here. Do you fear that there is a danger or an Israeli intention to absorb the West Bank while a stall goes on about these talks? I don't know whether they have the means to totally absorb the West Bank at this time, but I, I think that there's evidence that they've uh, wanted to strengthen their hands somewhat, knowing that this would be a part of the coming negotiations. All right, Larry, a quick one. We only have about a minute or two. Mr. President, uh, Lawrence O'Rourke from the St. Louis Post Dispatch. I'd like to ask you about your administration's decision to buy up the uh, dioxin tainted property in Times Beach. Uh, what was your reason, what were your reasons for uh, approving that purchase and uh, what is your sense of whether you are creating a precedent should similar situations uh, arise in the future? Well, I think this is an unusual situation there. Uh, we have uh, taken more than, uh, from locations, more than 300, more than 300 locations, these samples. Uh, they have been We've augmented the number of laboratories that were checking them and um, have come up with the findings that there is no question about the hazard for people that are living there. And uh, we are going to go forward with a cleanup, which will take a long time. But in the meantime, uh, we, the government, for their safety, ordered their people out of their homes and uh, some businesses have are literally destroyed uh, local businesses there because of uh, this creating of a ghost town, I think that it was one of the only fair things to do. Does it create a precedent, Mr. President, for uh, future si uh, situations? Well, if all of the factors uh, came together as they did in that one community, uh, uh, possibly it did. Mr. President, we're at 10 o'clock. I've seen at least a half a dozen other hands, but I understand you have to leave at this moment. Uh, I did leave. I tried to be fair. I, I called them as I saw them. I left some people out. <laughs> Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Uh, and I want to, well, I want to thank you, Mr. President, for, uh, for giving us this hour. Uh, uh, and any time you want to come over and have bacon and eggs over at the Sheraton Carlton, uh, just let us know. We'll, we'll make room. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Well, I thank you, and I thank you all for coming. And I know exactly how you feel. Uh, I know you're a veteran at this, but uh, uh, this is the way I feel after every press conference. Uh, all the 
haunts me are the number of hands that were up that, uh, that I wasn't able to recognize. It never bothers me if you'll just call on me. That's, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. But that's what everyone says. I know, I know, I know. Well, thank you all so right. much, sir. Oh, you bet. Appreciate it. Well, happy to have had you. Thank you, Mr. President. Particularly to my people on my left here and to Mark Shields and others, I was really finally on I apologize. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. 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 Ye